All right. You need anything else to eat? There's been some fruit over there, some to drink. I hope those of you guys that were in Brother Wright's uh, previous class, you guys figured out how to teach the church. We're all heard. Is that how that works? All right. For this class, this is going to feel more like a workshop. If you have something to write with, that'll be helpful. Yeah. Or or to record something. Um, we're gonna do some practices today. That um, I feel like if you can master this skill, if if I could choose one skill that if mastered, this could just make your teaching so easy. But we're not very good at it sometimes. Oh. Listen, don't. I gotta leave it there because we're gonna be on the. Oh, we're gonna be on the board. No, 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 no you're good. So the skill that we're gonna practice today is asking inspired questions. So I was uh, teaching a class, uh, an institute class with YSA um, last semester. I wasn't a huge fan of how the curriculum was written. I get, I get uppity about that. Up sometimes. Um, I but I I decided that I was going to simplify some things, and in this class, I I developed three inspired questions each class with some quotes and some scriptures, and that was all I ever prepared. And we would have fantastic discussions in the classroom because we because I spent a little bit of time focusing on questions that could be asked. And so we're gonna we're gonna kind of do that a little bit today. We're gonna practice it. Okay. Um is anybody in here that uh oh, let's see who's who's who has taught the most seminary in here? How long have you been teaching? This is either my 30th or 31st year. Oh. <laughs> yeah, man, you yes. no. mailbox every day. I tell you what, 30 years, that almost puts you in a position where you can remember where they used to pay you. Did I you get paid? I paid $700 a month by then. Years, but 30 almost takes you out of, yeah. out of the running so world. Off and on, they pull me out every once in a while for unimportant things. Do you remember? This is an old manual. It was called the Gospel Teaching and Learning Handbook. And there were certain principles that we tried to achieve, certain things, certain goals we tried to achieve every time we had a lesson. Um, just to kind of Sorry, President Nelson. <laughs> see if you can remember, see if you can tell me what these words, what these letters represent. If if I was a seminary teacher five, six, seven years ago, this was kind of the pattern. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Do you? Who said it? Okay, give me, give me give me just the first one so they know where we're going. Content. Content and, and we have, we usually put content and context. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to? You know where we're going? This is a pattern we try to do every lesson. We need to do establish content and context for the verses that we're about to teach. Yeah. I. Fine. Identify the God. Identify the principles. Um. President uh, Irene would say that a principle is is a little nugget of truth or doctrine that's packaged for application, right? Mm -hmm. And so we would we would give the content and context for the chapter we're about to teach, and then each in each little segment of verses, we would try to have our students identify a principle from those ver from those verses. Okay, they just take out a truth. What's you understand them? Understand that principle. So they'd ID the principle. And we'd have them understand the principle, right? 
And then we would feel. We would seek to have them feel. Uh, let's see, was it feeling something else? I think it was just feel. We, we wanted them to feel the truth of the principle. And then the last one, apply. apply. I think if you would look at your, like your, any given Sunday kind of a thing, any lesson that you would give, you probably still do something like this. You just don't know it, right? Before you can start talking about a chapter, we usually do what? <coughs> content or content. Yeah, we're, we're usually like, so what's happening in this chapter? Do you guys remember yesterday, you know, Nephi and his dad, they left Jerusalem and now, you remember that? Like we establish content context all the time, right? Um, each of these though, um, are, I mean, these are just really simple little steps that we could take. What makes and breaks a good lesson isn't so much that we're able to do any of this. What's that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. If you've ever taught, I, as a teacher, I would always, you know, we would solidly get to hear at least. Right? <laughs> and then it's like, oh, we're out of time. Figure out how to do it. But there's there is a skill on hitting each of these through asking good questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I actually have uh, teaching in the Savior's way up on the board. In fact, if you could pull it up, that would be great. You guys have access to it. If you go to the Gospel Library app and uh, you can go to, you can do it in one of two ways. You can either go to handbooks and callings and then go to seminaries and you'll be able to find it there. Or you can go to books and lessons. But if you can find Savior's Way and, and then go to the Teach the Doctrine section, and then we're going to go to focus on truths that lead to conversion. I actually want to spend a second looking at the Savior's example of how he did this before we actually look at some the skills of, of asking good questions. Okay? Could you tell us again the route? Right here. So once you get to teaching in the Savior's okay. Way, Teach the doctrine. Teach the doctrine and then focus on truths. <laughs> and I'm going to share my screen. It's going to look like this section. The Savior taught truths. Yep. The Savior taught truths that lead to conversion and build faith. Um, can, can we read this? There's a couple of paragraphs. Can we get a, a one reader per paragraph? You got You got a reader? You got a reader? I get a couple more. You got to read it, got to read it, got to read it. Okay, so we got one, two, three, four, five. So we'll go in that order. One Sabbath day, the Savior and his disciples, feeling hungry, passed a field and started eating the grain. The Pharisees, always eager, eager to emphasize the finer points of the law of Moses, pointed out that gathering grain was technically a form of work, which was forbidden on the Sabbath. To use the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob's phrase, the Pharisees were looking beyond the mark. In other words, they were so focused on traditional interpretations of the commandments that they missed the divine purpose of those commandments to draw us closer to God. In fact, the Pharisees didn't even realize that the one who gave the commandment to honor the Sabbath was standing before them. All right, number two. The Savior took this opportunity to testify of his divine identity and to teach why the Sabbath is important. It was created for us as a day to worship the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ himself. Such truths help us understand that God's commandments are about more than just our outward behavior. They are meant to help us change our hearts and become more fully converted. Number three, <clears throat> carefully consider the doctrines and principles you decide to focus on. While there are many truths in the scriptures that can be discussed, it is best to focus on truths of the gospel that lead to conversion and build faith in Jesus Christ. The simple, basic truths of the Savior taught and exemplified have the greatest power to change our lives. Truths about his atonement, plan of salvation, the commandments to love God, and love our neighbor, and so on. Invite the Spirit to bear witness of these truths, helping them go deep into the hearts of Christians. Okay. Questions to ponder. What are some truths of the gospel that have helped you become more converted to Jesus Christ and have greater faith in him? How has the teacher helped you focus on the most essential truths of the gospel? What can you teach that will help others become more deeply converted to Jesus Christ? Sorry, there's not a fifth paragraph. <laughs> what do we learn about the Savior's example here? About 
focusing on truths that lead to conversion. What does he do well that we would do well to emulate? To focus, make the focus to become closer to God. Okay. We're going to look at a couple of upcoming blocks of scripture that you are going to be teaching next week. If we're not careful, we're going to get distracted. That's 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 the both the joy of the Book of Mormon and also kind of the, I don't want to say hazard, but maybe the warning and the challenge is the stories are so great that the stories could become the focus of our lessons. But what does the Savior do? We need to make sure we're focusing and giving them opportunity to learn the principles that lead to him and conversion to him. Okay? So I have a couple of blocks. We're going to we're going to do this. I'm going to combine what we just discussed with this. We're going to act as if we're preparing these these for teaching next week and feel free to totally use this, okay? Cuz it's coming up, right? This is Mondays. You're supposed to do uh 6 and 7 on one day, right? Um and then we actually have several days in person society. But what I want to do is this. You guys are kind of grouped up. You chose your group. Except you're all by the way. You'll stay here? Okay. You're, you're in group. So this is going to be kind of your, your think tank, who you're sitting next to. And you're going to, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things that um, may require you to be searching and looking and understanding. But then you're also going to bounce ideas off of each other and kind of shape some things. This is the joys of of being in a kind of a lab like this. So keeping the fact that we're going to try to make sure that we identify principles that we get conversion, that is your ultimate goal for this. I'm going to ask you to do, we're going to do one together. We're going to kind of work on it together, but then I'm going to then have you go and try to create your own questions and whatnot from chapter eight. So we're going to do first Nephi six together. Okay, so here's the first things first. If uh, if you'll go to First Nephi six, three through six, assuming you're about to teach this with your students in mind, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to ask. I want you to develop a question that will fit with each of these for verses three through six. Do you understand what I'm asking you to do? Imagine you're preparing this for a lesson. You're looking at verses three through six. What would be a solid context question? What principle, how would you get them to identify a principle? What questions would you ask them to help them understand it, feel it, and apply it? You good? So take a second and read it by yourself first. And let's just, just kind of, this is your first kind of attempt at this. And then we'll share some thoughts, maybe make some adjustments. And then I'm going to ask you to do a larger section here in a second. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to read those verses and to maybe come up with some ideas. Right, 
I don't mind if you approach all of them to see if you can come up with a question. Well, we could let them go. We are or we can ask them again. I think it's more than 45 minutes. What else is done? I think we need to ask them again. I think that's really important. That we can, if we can, like the right need to say, we can watch them again. So I think it's more than a topic slot. I think it's more than a topic slot. I think it's more than a topic slot. Yeah, that is the principle. So, you know, why did I talk, I talk to the reader here? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what it's about. Okay, so, we try to make more explains. I think we need to take those questions. What do you want to know? Maybe they read a couple of verses. Look at that piece. Yes, so what is supposed to be highlighted? What did you find? Well, we're not going to be going to be going to What's happening? Is context just story? Are we just, is that all context is? It could be where the author is coming from. I mean, for me, the context, but that just doesn't really feel like that. For me, the context is plates aren't big enough to write everything. Yeah. And so, so what does he choose to do? Yeah. I'm right now in the middle. I have to make sure. Yep. So I say, look in verses 25 and tell me what. With that, but but I still feel like that is a tough because you're not asking the identified question yet because then you're going to go from that question to the next What is he shooting? I think four or five. What is four five? You're good, right? What do you find? What is the I I like and I will say really, this is really the one I wish please do it. I'm gonna give you a couple of men minutes to work through this and I want to hear some of your thoughts. Hey, 
Okay, I want to hear some of your thoughts just in these three verses. How do we feel it? So, what did you think about just the exercise of trying to get you to ask questions? But go ahead. Yeah. Please. So one of the questions I had was, why is Nephi keeping a journal in the first place? Okay. And what does that mean to our seminary students about keeping a journal? If Ooh. Nephi wanted his posterity to know about Christ, and he knew that he was going to die at some point, but he might have surviving posterity that never knew him. Yeah. What does that say to your seminary student about keeping a journal? And what are the most important things that they could write in a journal, assuming they're going to have posterity? That's interesting. Yeah. One of the context things that I forgot I started thinking about it was that story about Jim Smith and Martin Harris that was very much in the Jackson. Is that and that's part of the context? What that the is context. part of the context, right? Oh, I was just going to go off of that. Uh, uh, keeping a journal essentially, but he's doing it back in the day when it probably weighed a lot more than <laughs> what we can just have now. Especially now with smartphones, you can have essentially a whole library of writing within a small yeah. device. And what we said pointed out was he kind of kept a journal with his original sure. record, yep. right, where he talked about the wars and contentions and blah, blah, and this yep. is a condensed version now that he's doing, and he's going to put in just the most important. Okay, good, yeah. Just a comment about this process. Okay, please. Um, and that is, is that we found pretty quickly that a lot of the questions that we were coming up with were interchangeable among these different areas. Yep. Um, and it occurred to me that text is not important and that the pro it helps us to come up with these questions to try them, but we don't have to fit them into that little category, mm -hmm. but they prompt us to you, come up with these questions. Back. You won't find this in, each, in uh, teaching the same way. Like this is kind of gone because it doesn't. But if you can identify that different questions are going to actually do different things in your classroom and you're intentional about that, it, it's it's going to improve the experience. Yes, please. I just have a comment that most of the revelation that I get when I'm receiving, when I'm doing my lessons, is questions to ask the kids. That's probably 99.9% .9 of revelation that comes when I'm preparing lessons. Okay. I love that witness and testimony. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in this case, I just think um, it it answers the question: Why is it worth my time to read the Book of Mormon? Yeah. Okay, so here here's what I want to do. You guys ready? Um, did any did anybody struggle with any type of question? Context, maybe a little bit. Do you do we know the difference between a good question to ask in a seminary classroom and a bad question to ask in a seminary cl classroom? After we've asked. Yeah, it's something we can repent in the moment, right? It's just enough. Yeah. Um, I I was just thinking about a conversation that I had with my husband after church one Sunday when he went to an elder forum lesson, and and I said, "How was it?" And he said, "You know what really drives me nuts is when the teacher asks a question, but it's obvious that they want a certain answer, and nobody's coming up with that exact answer." Like, yeah, but he yeah, knows. and so everyone's just like, "I don't know." Uh -oh. you know? And he said, I felt like that was happening during the whole lesson. It was so frustrating to him. It was frustrating to us. Um, people were giving great insight, but it was like, nope, that's not it. That's not the one, you know? And so I've thought about that a lot. Like, Guess what I'm thinking that. are terrible yeah. questions. <laughs> Absolutely. That's my yeah. I wasn't in here all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, when you're thinking, like, I mean, unless it's like something, you know, like, who had a vision, you, you know, or, and you're talking about Doctor and Covenants, you're talking specifically about Joseph Smith, but I'm not saying, but in general, like, to have a more open-ended question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in school and in church, one of the things that bother me is if someone asks a question, or the answer is in the end, that you just, some, you just read something, and the teacher asks the question, how is something you just read? Yeah. Right out of what you just read. I'm like, my brain's gone, I'm out, bye. Where's my, where's my phone? You know, so I um, so I am immediately bored by the question. I don't ask it. So I ask questions 
that are that are not just repeat out of the book or out of the scripture passage you just read. It's more you gotta it's more to think about the, if you said the principle or how to apply that about what you just read. Yes, sir. Well, the other problem, Mary, is when the teacher fancies himself the the scripturian or the, the gospel scholar, right? And the question is asked on something so esoteric or so kind of minute that nobody knows it, but then he gets to tell me. And he's like, let right. me spread my wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lord, did you ever have them? Um, yes, yeah, and I believe the most. Uh, what are we what are we trying to do with questions? Get their brain thinking. Get them thinking? Yeah. That's one of the things that I, I was struggling with questions and looking at this. The first thing I needed to do was identify what I want to teach. Right. Because if without me identifying what was really important in there, I couldn't ask the right question. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. One of the things that occurred to me as we were doing this and as you were talking was how would, like, for example, content and context, what is there about the content and context of this that would bring them to Christ? And so it was interesting when I started thinking that way, it changed a little bit about how I looked at it. So for example, as I'm looking at the, <laughs> at the context, you know, part of the context of this is that there's not enough room to write everything we want. And so when I'm thinking, well, in our own lives, do we make enough room for the faith? And so just not that I might go that way in the classroom, but it helped me understand in what ways might the content matter. Now, I like what you did there because that's that's kind of the ultimate practice here is no matter the question we're asking, is it going to lead them back to Christ or is it trivia or is it guess what I'm thinking or is it I'm smarter than you and let me prove it like what, what is it doing? So content and context, that, that's a pretty straightforward question to ask. But if your intent is, I want them to be able to see the Savior here, even if it's a content and a context question, that's going to change it slightly. Okay? Now, uh, because of our lack of time, I, I want to do, uh, I want to move to this, this next section. Okay? I chose section, uh, chapter eight on purpose. Number one, it's coming up. None? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, there's just one more question. Please. How can we get our students to break the habit of answering the questions that the right answer mm -hmm. instead of thinking what it does to teach me today? A really great question. <laughs> Thoughts on that? How do you get your students to be real in their responses and not just saying what they think that, mm -hmm. that you want them to say? We might have to change it. I don't know. I think you build up that trust in time and know that like this is a safe place that you can share. We're not going to make fun of you. And kind of, I talked about unity in yeah. the beginning of, of the class. They kind of feel like this is a safe place. They can share their real thoughts and feelings. And I think as you build and grow on that, they feel they can share what they really think. And, and I think I think there was a key there. Change. We need to change our questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. One other thought on that is after we change those questions is giving them opportunities to discuss as a group. We sit in small groups and when they have the chance to share their thoughts with each other and then share back out to class, there's safety in it. There's rich discussion and we really have some really good deep insight. Good. Absolutely. How, how afraid are we of... Because I think that that is a, an interesting practice and skill. Are, are we afraid of silence when we ask questions? Sometimes the silence means that was a dumb question. <laughs> Sometimes the silence is, I need to think about it. Sometimes the silence is, I don't know if I'm willing to share it in front of everybody. Um, and so what we kind of did here, for example, is I let you work in small groups and, and you started asking questions of each other and you were able to formulate and change some things. There's there's some power in what Sister Malin just shared. Yes, ma'am. I also think like giving them an opportunity with your question to give their opinion, that either opinion is safe. You know what I mean? It's like almost like, hey, what do you guys think is more like what do you what do you feel about it? Is this worth 
more than this or this, right. like and mm -hmm. kind of and then if they're willing to volunteer their opinion then it gives you an opportunity like okay so why do you feel that way why, why did you you know and i think it gives more customized answers if it's more of an opinion spectrum that's a safe opinion spectrum right. obviously not like is this right or wrong you know why do you think that's right you know and to be honest I, I get a lot of traction when i ask a question if i were to ask like I'll ask a question and I'll say, is that a dumb question? <laughs> and let them actually respond back to what they think about that. And then we can sometimes as a class yeah. formulate a better question and, and they can help and assist that. And then it's way more relevant because they help bring it up. Did you have something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I feel like it can also at times be a progression of questions. Yep. And so sure, it might be a simple question to start you know, people just saying something, yeah. but then going based off of the follow-up well, questions. Yeah, the follow-up questions matter a lot. Just yep. the same. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Here and then here. Okay. Okay, because I'm going to say that this is something I learned when I was teaching too, and she's about to answer this really the question. Um, what she taught me to do is again, when you're trying to get people to um, give answers, sometimes you take, you take out a post-it notes and hand them around, and then have them write on a post-it note. And then I'll have them put the answers up on the board and then uh, with post notes, and then I'll read all of them. So there's like less, um, uh, less pressure. pressure to speak out loud or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah a lot of uh, just yeah, and one of the reasons for sometimes for doing that for me is to, um, I forgot your name. I Pierce. Yes, yeah, thank me. you, Pierce. <laughs> he was talking about the progression of questions, and sometimes for me it's the progression of processing the yep. question first you have them read and write down what they saw and now share with your neighbor and hear what your neighbor has to say and then now have your neighbor share what you said and what you liked about it or what you could add to it yeah. kind of like preparing their minds or giving more time to think i also ask dumb questions on purpose <laughs> because i want to ask the follow-up question Right. I, I, I want I, I I'm going to ask a yes and no question because they all know that they should say yes or they all should say no, because then I'm going to go. Yeah, but why? So that that's something. Yeah. Oh, wait. Sorry. I, yeah. I have, um, yeah, also, I think one of the things that can be fascinating is to make sure that we're observing the students Yeah. so that we notice, you know, are their facial expressions changing? Mm -hmm. Is there something that, as they're reading individually, that you see that they become engaged right. or that they're responding the way someone else answered a question or something like that? Because they may not be willing to share someone right away, but if they're called on to better formulate this little moment of, yeah. of having felt something, yeah. then they can better be taught by spirit as they share it with others. Okay, go, go with me to first Nephi 8. I chose this on purpose because you all know it, number one. It is coming up, number two. And if we are not careful, we can just ask a lot of dumb questions. Because it, if we're not careful on something like Lehi's vision, we're going to ask a lot of context questions. Like what happens here and what happens this and what do we think this is and da 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 da. da. So what what I want to do is I want you to come kind of with fresher eyes. I'm, I gave you a big block, verses one through eighteen. Here's what I want you to do: if you could ask, if you could just ask one inspired question to a group of youth after they have read these verses, that would invite them to experience faith in and conversion to Jesus Christ, what would that question be? So instead of looking at a context question or identify a principle question or feel it or apply it, whatever it is, I actually, you can only ask one that will allow a student to experience Jesus Christ in some way, okay? Do you understand the challenge? Okay, go through the verses. There's 18 of them. I want you to craft a solid question, but only one. Only one.
Mm -hmm. We've already stepped going to the next step. Mm -hmm. Do you want a little bit more time to read, or shall we share? Mm -hmm. I actually want you to share in, in your tables first. You ready? Share your questions with your table if you're ready. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So then they like watch their horror story and some things like that. I've seen that, but I know a couple of people are gonna watch it here in the second year and they're not gonna watch all of them. So we're gonna watch it. Yay. I saw it from the smoke and all the things in the plate. Did anybody struggle coming up with a question? Oh one two three four. Okay, so are you willing to offer it up for us so that we can help? Okay, so Mr. Nanny, go ahead. So what okay. so I was gonna say I think that we oftentimes hold the dispute is way far off, but it's really representing the informed price is something that we can access all the time. Okay. So what does that look like? What does it look like to have gotten to the truth? Because you know, in, from my perspective, anytime you repent or you sacrament, then you know we're accessing the informant. So do we get to the tree or not? You know, what does it look like when we get there? And so if you're if your thing, what you're really feeling for your students is I need them to understand that getting to the tree and partaking of the fruit is participating and feeling the blessings from the atonement of Christ. Okay. Help us out. What's the question? How would you how would you help them in their coming unto Christ and converting to him through this story? What kind of question, questions? What do you think? I would just say, how do you recognize the love of God in your life? I would like a long first thing line. How do you recognize when you are partaking of the fruit? Okay. Other thoughts? And I would add to that and say, um, and who does the Lord want to share that fruit with? Sure. Because this is the so Book of Mormon is about the gathering of Israel. This is about sharing of that. Yeah. I would start with why. Why was it so important for Lehi for his children to partake of the fruit? Because I really feel like that's where the students are. They're deciding is the gospel important enough? And so that's where I'd start. And then and then I'd go. Because the answer to that question, if, if, if she was the teacher and just said, why was it so important for Lehi to share the fruit with his kids? What would be your responses? Well, they wanted him to be happy, to feel joy. Mm -hmm. That's what I see in the scripture. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Love. Yeah. yeah, love his family. Yeah. It was so delicious to him. The fact that they weren't doing it was kind of separating them from each other. Right. And my, my question kind of was, was along the same lines, but a little bit different. It was more like, how would you feel if you were Lehi and this was your family? Yeah. And so then trying to put them into that, and hopefully they can then branch out into what does that look like for you? Yeah. Please. You asked us to have our students in mind, please, as we formulated the question and thinking. Of my various ones that don't have a Lehi in their home who would ask, make that invitation. I said, regardless of whether you have a father inviting or encouraging you to come and taste of the fruit, what are you doing in your own life to, to uh, partake of it? I love that. My, my mind was very similar. I'm, I'm thinking of very specific students in my mind. And my question that I came up with is what does it feel like to travel? in darkness for the space of many hours. Because I guarantee you, uh, the ones I'm thinking of know exactly what that feels like. And I can then ask a follow-up question that, that would lead them to the tree, right? Yeah. I was just, mine was similar to yours in that it was, who has the Lord sent to you to guide you in darkness? Yeah. And recognizing, because in here, in the story, it has... There were there was someone that was there to help them. Yeah, love it. There were two questions on the Please. chat. Uh, one, if I was oh, from the same person, there's connected. If I was one of the participants in the dream, who am I at this time and why? And if I'm like Lehi, what part of the dream am I in right now? Interesting. I love that. Those are great. 
I have I have written next to verses 10, 11, 12. When have I experienced this? That was just the question I asked myself. When 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 have I experienced partaking of the fruit, filling my soul with joy, and then desiring to share it with others? Okay. Please. We even talked about or going way back and having them think about something that they've tasted or experienced they've done in their life that was so awesome or so good that they want to share want other people to try it and experience it, you know, like even have them thinking about, okay, what's the, you know, what's the best meal you've ever had in your life, you know, or if you had your last meal on earth, what would it be? And sure. just kind of this discussion of like, hey, when you love something, Want other people to try it and experience it as well. You could ask them questions that recall their previous experiences, like, how did you feel when you got home from FSY? After they'd partaken that fruit and were so excited and so how did that feel? And what did you want to do and share with others? Because that they've they've had spiritual experiences. So okay, what what did we just do? That's a good question. What did that do for you and for us as we asked those questions? We didn't even really ask the questions for you to answer them, but how many of you how many of you were answering them yourselves as you heard these really solid questions? I think we considered what it was we really wanted our students to learn. Right. That's what you're breaking it down into your highest priority. What is the most important thing for our students? The difference between a solid seminary experience and mm -hmm. not typically comes down to the types of questions we're willing to ask right? yeah well i think it was interesting all three of us at, a, at our table have a daughter that's kind of straight yeah. and so resonated with me was the loud voice the loud voice with Levi. what question would you ask nephi and samuel and also Lamin and lemuel so i'm like do we always have do we not give up my question are we is, loud we, enough are we loud enough and are we in a position to be by the trees showing our light. Sometimes I feel like we overcomplicate the seminary lesson experience. Um, in the last seminary teaching uh, assignment that I had, that was just a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I had a fairly wide open classroom and I went, took all my artwork down off the walls and I just put a bunch of whiteboards everywhere. And we typically had experiences at least once a week where I had one single question on my whiteboard and a giant block of verses. And I would say, I need you to read those verses and try to answer that question and put what you're learning on your whiteboard. And I would step away for the next 20 minutes. And then I just walk around and ask them questions of what they're writing. And I was usually playing devil's advocate, you know, why, why do you say this? Or you have a friend that feels very differently than what you just wrote. What do you tell them? Like I just go around and poke holes in all their stuff. And eventually we get to the point where we're experiencing what it feels like to turn our hearts to Christ. Yes, ma'am. And I got this idea from somewhere, someone in here, but I just want to, the best thing that I have done, or one of the best things I've done is my devotional now is at the end of my class. And um, the person is picked and they have to ask, and the, they answer two questions. First of all, what did I learn today? And second of all, what am I gonna do differently because of what I learned today? And that just is such a wonderful way to conclude. And the other interesting thing about that, which I say to them, notice how what she says she's gonna do today might be different than what you say. And I tell them that's the spirit speaking to you. I love that. One of, one of my favorite consistent questions that I feel like I have to ask a lot, and it's almost every day, yeah. is what do we learn about God in whatever we're talking about? Yeah. Elder Bednar would ask a question like, what did you hear that was never said? That's a question he likes to ask. Or he would say, what is something that you need to stop doing that you're currently doing? Or what is something you need to start doing that you're not doing? He'd ask those types of questions. I, I hope what you're kind of getting from this is um, let's not let's not rush this part of lesson prep. Yes, it's important that you know more about this chapter than your students. It's helpful that you're you know you're at least one day ahead of them, right? Yes, it's important that you understand the scriptures. Yes, 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 but don't rush the 
What do I want? What experiences do my students need? What truths do they need to understand better? And what questions can I ask to lead them to that discovery? Okay. It would be really easy if we just had all the truths listed on the board and said, here's what I want you to learn today. Okay. But it's more important when they learn it. So. Okay. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Please take a break. Thank you.